You guys want to see the scorecard of Augusta National with the nines reversed? It's right there. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Welcome to Office Hours, presented by Holderness and Born. I am your host, Michael Wolf, and today we're going to talk about one of my favorite things in the whole world, the Masters and Augusta National Golf Club. This is the Masters today, right? It's green, it's gorgeous, everybody loves it. It's the most watched golf tournament of the year. It's held on the most famous golf course of the world. How did it get that way? Why is it so freaking awesome? Let's start at the beginning. This is what Augusta National looked like at the turn of the century, right? It wasn't yet a golf course. I think most of you know, the Fruitlands Nursery maybe you've heard of, Berkman's maybe you've heard of, but how did all that come together? What was the deal? It was owned by these guys. That's Prosperous Julius Alphonse Berkman's and his three sons, Ali, Robert, and Lewis. The property had been operated uh, by these guys since 1857 when they came to America. First azaleas brought to the United States were by the uh, Berkman family and they kind of made them a commercially viable plant in the United States and popular and now we got azaleas. So Prosper dies in 1910. Um, he, leaves the, he leaves the Fruitland business, the nursery he leaves to the three sons. All that property is basically what is the golf course today. Uh, his house, he leaves to his wife, um, which is today the clubhouse, the same one. Rumored to be the first concrete structure in uh, r a private residence in the state of Georgia. Trouble was, the wife was his second wife. She was 30 years younger than he was. Uh, she was younger than his sons were. And so putting two to two together there, things didn't go that smoothly. One thing leads to another. Everybody decides they want to get out of it. The boys sell off the land in the back. They move away. Two of them go up to New York. They become pretty successful um, horticulturalists. And the second Mrs. Berkman sells the house, she exits stage right. So the most common version of the story then is that Bobby Jones swoops in and buys the property from the Berkmans, right? Not quite. We have our first plot twist. And that is because the real buyer of the Berkman property was this cat, Commodore J. Perry Stoltz. Stoltz owns a 15-story hotel called the Fleetwood in Miami Beach. And like his rival, Conrad Hilton, Stoltz is looking to expand. This is uh, kind of the era where the idea came up of like a chain of hotels and he wants to build a 15-story hotel called the Fleetwood uh, on what is now the Augusta property. Stoltz buys the property September of 1925. So within six months, Stoltz is going full steam ahead, right? He's uh, got construction started on the hotel. He's got a spur built off of a train line so he can deliver supplies. And they're going to put up this 15-story new Fleetwood Hotel right behind where today's Augusta Clubhouse is. And it was gonna have a golf course as well. There were plans for a golf course. There were never plans developed, or at least there's not like a routing map or anything like that. We don't know who was gonna build this golf course, but the Commodore was gonna have a big old hotel and a golf course right where Augusta National is today. So just as quickly as Stoltz has arrived, everybody in Augusta gets excited, Stoltz is out. What happens? Tragedy. One of the largest hurricanes in history up to that point has hit Miami. The Fleetwood Hotel in Miami is wiped out. Stoltz's finances are wiped out. And that's the end of Stoltz in the Augusta story. The property lays vacant for several years until 1931, when for $70,000, a group of businessmen buy the property with the intention of turning it into a golf course. Why is this big news? Because the guy leading that group was none other than, as you may guess, the great Bobby Jones, who has just retired from what was up to that point, the greatest competitive golf career in history. Bobby Jones was only 29 years old when his Augusta project began, but the golf world had been focused on the golf prodigy as early as 1916 when he reached the quarterfinals of the U.S. Amateur at Marion. He was 14 years old when he played in that U.S. Amateur at Marion, and he was only a freshman in high school. So how good was Bobby Jones? He was so good, I had to write all the stuff down about him uh, so I wouldn't forget it to tell you guys. 1923, he wins his first U.S. Open, right? Then he wins at least one major every year for eight straight years. In that stretch of eight years, the guy won 13 majors. He won five U.S. Amateurs, which is the most ever. In the finals of those five Amateurs, he wins nine and eight, eight and seven, eight and seven, 10 and nine, eight and seven. Sounds like he was playing poosh the entire time. He wins four US Opens, three in a row. Only guy to ever win three US Opens in a row. That wasn't true, that was Willie Anderson from the Anderson golf shirt that I was wearing yesterday. Okay, he only plays in five British Opens his entire career and he wins three of the four he played in. And then of course he wins the British Amateur one time during the 1930 um, Grand Slam. He did all of that while graduating from high school at 16 years old. In 1922, the year before he won his first US Open, he graduated with a mechanical engineering degree from Georgia Tech. Two years later in 1924, the guy graduates with an English literature degree from a little place called Harvard. 
Then in 1928, he passes the bar after only studying at Emory Law School for one year. So in a six year stretch, the guy wins 13 majors and he earns himself three degrees. And then he retires and get this, he retires at the same age as Anthony Kim. So Bobby Jones retires at the ripe old age of 28 years old, uh, but he's got some other things, um, other ideas in mind for how he wants to spend the rest of his life. One of those is he always had a fascination with building his dream golf course, right? He's been, you know, he's a, he's a worldwide celebrity by now. He's just come off a ticker tape parade down the Canyon of Heroes in New York City when he returns from winning the Grand Slam in 1930. He's decided he wants to build a golf course where he and his friends can kind of hang out and play away from you know, the, the crowds of adoring fans, and he settles on Augusta National to build that place. It was this man, Alistair McKenzie, that Jones ultimately settled on to help make his um, plans a reality. And together, the pair would build the most famous golf course in history. Okay, at this point in the video, you're thinking to yourself, maybe this guy knows a little bit about golf history, maybe he doesn't, but man, is he good looking. How do I end up with this? Holderness and Born Golf Apparel. Today, I'm wearing the Cal Nagel shirt. Cal Nagel, 1960 British Open champion, winner of 94 tournaments around the world, and possessor of the greatest nickname in Australian golf history, the Pimble Crusher. Take that, Greg Norman. These guys really get it. Um, you can kind of tell in the colors they pick, in the cuts of their shirts. I can get parallel in their stuff. Um, they got great colors. It holds up good in the wash. It's good stuff. They're a good company, good guys. Available in all the finest golf courses um, out there. Go check out their website. Um, they got QZs, they got Q snaps. I didn't even know about Q snaps. Now I know about Q snaps. Holderness and Born, thanks guys, and uh, go check them out. So I find it interesting um, how the courses continue to evolve. The fact that it started with these masters, um, Alistair McKenzie, maybe the greatest architect um, in golf history, Bobby Jones, maybe the greatest player in golf history, what they built versus what the greatest players in the world are playing today, right? There's some obvious changes. They reversed the nines. The 11th hole used to be a pretty severe downhill dogleg right par four. The T was to the right of what's today's 10th green and kind of bent around the corner to where today's 11th green is. Um, 16th hole used to be played diagonally across a tiny little creek and the tee box for 16 was to the right of 15 green instead of to the left of 15 green. Even on 15, the pond in front of 15 wasn't there. It was just a little creek that was kind of in the shape of a horseshoe that kind of wiggled right in front of the green, but no big pond. It's a golf course that has to constantly evolve and change because uh, it's the only golf course in the world that hosts the world's best players in a major championship every year. So some things about the golf course that you wouldn't know because they're no longer even there. There was a 19th hole when the place opened. Um, there was a little tee just to the right of the ninth green where you essentially played up to the practice green, today's practice green. The driving range was right in between the uh, the 18th hole and kind of the ninth fairway. They would just blast golf balls right down to the middle there to warm up. And that included long after the Masters started. That's where they used to warm up. The driving range was there for quite a while. You know, that stuff's long gone, but uh, also part of the interesting history of the club. So Bobby Jones decided to have an invitational at Augusta National, right? That's the next step in our story. Never with any real intentions that it would be considered a major championship or a championship of anything. It was going to be an invitational golf tournament for the world's best players. You know, you had to be a champion of one of the major events, whether it was an op uh, open or an amateur tournament. He also was big on supporting the amateur game. Anybody that made a Walker Cup team was going to be invited to play in this tournament. And it was really kind of to be a get together of what he thought were the best in the game. They also made a real point of uh, making special invitations to people all the way back to their first, um, their very first tournaments. They invited two guys from Japan, which was kind of unheard of at the time. Um, it was the first time Japanese golfers were ever um, invited to you know, an event or any kind of sporting competition in America of this stage. It was a big enough event for the Japanese that the um, Japanese ambassador to the United States came to Augusta, Georgia just to watch these guys play because they were representing their country on really the biggest stage that any Japanese athletes ever had. I think that continues today, and I think a kind of a new wrinkle is with the Liv guys, right? It's gonna be interesting each year uh, you know, Liv will have kind of this off season, a lot of chatter between the players on the PGA Tour, Liv players. Um, they're only gonna get together four times a year, and the first time they do that is obviously gonna be at the Masters, and really probably the first time some of these guys are gonna be talking to each other will be behind closed doors at the Masters, uh, you know, Champions Dinner um, on Tuesday night. So as much as the Masters is beloved today, um, kind of a slow start, to be honest with you, it got off to. They didn't have a full f field for the first year of like major champions and stuff. A lot of guys skipped it. Gene Sarazen tells a famous story that he got the invitation 
It came from Clifford Roberts, not Bobby Jones. The story may or may not be true, so Sarazen just like threw the invitation away because he thought it was like some, you know, marketing thing for some guy that worked at a bank. We do know that to fill out the field, uh, Bobby Jones did fill it with a bunch of guys from Spalding. Uh, Bobby Jones was on Spalding's staff by then, and essentially Spalding kind of leaned on him to put a bunch of club pros who had deals with Spalding to let them play in the uh, championship. The draw the early years, there's no question, was Bobby Jones, right? Um, it was the one chance a year for the public to see Bobby Jones um, play. He didn't play all that particularly well. He never broke 70 in any of his rounds in the Masters, um, but just seeing Bobby Jones out there was a big deal. Again, like Anthony Kim. I mean, imagine if Anthony Kim only played one term a year, or Tiger Woods is it's kind of starting to evolve into. It was the one chance for Bobby Jones. So the Masters in the early days, uh, it wasn't all easy going either, though. I mean, there's famous stories of, you know, them trying to give out tickets in the local banks. You could just pick up free tickets that were sitting there. Um, you know, anybody in the local area, they were trying to um, get to subscribe and buy badges every year, those types of things. They had a parade that went through downtown Augusta to try to generate interest where they had put the players in the backs of convertibles and made them parade down the street. There was a really interesting thing, I think, about the Masters, which was that at the beginning, all of the tournament rounds were played in the afternoons. And every morning, they had kind of a fan-friendly um, event. They would have a long driving contest. They would have a putting contest. They would have a clinic, like a precision iron contest. Those would all go on in the mornings and then to kind of build the crowd's interest. And then, and then they would actually play the tournament round in the afternoon. And then Jones had some smart people around him. I mean, Clifford Roberts, maybe not the greatest guy in the world, um, but um, pretty good ideas on how to market kind of the exclusivity of the place and the kind of the, uh, you know, the aura that had grown up around Bobby Jones. And from a practical standpoint, people like Grantlin Rice, close friend of Bobby Jones's, came up with, you know, ideas on the marketing of the place, like all the reporters, uh, baseball beat reporters were coming back from spring training. They would purposely schedule the masters so that all the reporters that were in the middle of riding trains back from um, spring training in Florida back up to the east, pretty good natural stopover point was Augusta National to check in on Bobby Jones's brand new golf tournament. The Masters in the 1950s didn't, you know, still didn't have a fence around the property. Um, they had to hire Pinkerton security guards instead of using volunteers or using uh, locals because they would let all their friends in for free is the reason they brought in the Pinkerton. So then in the 1960s, the Masters catches its big break, which is the combination of Arnold Palmer and television. Palmer wins four Masters starting in 1958, 1960, 62, and 64. At the same time, golf is becoming more popular. A booming economy means more people have free time and are taking up the game. More people have televisions. It all comes together um, in the 1960s and the Masters is off and running into really transitioning into what became the Masters as we know it today, which is you know certainly the biggest televised sporting event in the world for golf. So another thing that I love about the Masters, and I think most people do too, is the presentation of the thing, right? It's obviously in the springtime, a lot of the country, it's not in the springtime yet, but in Georgia it is. Interesting fun fact is that one of the reasons uh, Supposedly, Bobby Jones picked Augusta versus Atlanta, other than the fact that he was trying to get away from all his friends in Atlanta who were bugging him, is because Augusta, elevation-wise, sits kind of down in a hole. Um, it's, it's, it's at a much lower elevation than Atlanta is, and so it's got warmer winters, um, and it's able to, um, you know, spring up earlier. The Masters certainly takes advantage of that today. You know, one of the things that they do is they do this rye overseed. So the entire golf course is this rye grass. Why is it important? Because rye grass is really dark green and it's gorgeous. And it, com you know, combined with the hills, I think, in my opinion, and combined with the fact that the Masters is the only major championship that's held at the same location every year. And because of that, um, you know, and it's covered by the same broadcast partner, CBS, for a long, long time, you know, the shots that they get are really dialed in. And there's nowhere else in golf, like the picture on the screen right now, where you see a guy like Tiger Woods and there's nothing else in the shot except for dark green grass. So it's the only golf tournament each year where there's nobody allowed inside the ropes except for the players and the caddies. And that's something when I've talked to players um, that they think makes the place special as well. So as good as the Masters is to watch on television, and, and you know they keep evolving there, right? With uh, now they've got the shot by shot. You can watch every shot of every player. Uh, they were the first ones to have a good app. They're the first, they still have the best live scoring. It's crazy, they do one tournament a year, but somehow their, their televised viewing experience uh, their um, experience on your mobile device networks, scoring on the internet, it's all better than anybody else does, even though they only do it once a year. It's crazy. 
in person, it's even better than that. I've been fortunate to go several times. Everything about the Masters is as good as you've heard. It lives up to the hype. The bathrooms are nicer than the bathrooms in your house. The food is cheap. The beer is cold. There's no lines for anything. There's no garbage anywhere. Everything that you need, you'll find an answer to pretty quickly. And they prevent you from making dumb mistakes yourself, like bringing cell phones in. Um, and, and it all adds up to just this feeling that, you know, for one day in your life of everything being perfect. Should other golf courses try to pursue that kind of stuff? Should everybody um, spend the amount of money maintaining their golf courses that Augusta National does? No. Is it a good thing that, you know, only a few people, um, you know, a few select people get to play Augusta National and the rest of us are shut out? Probably not. But it's pretty darn cool that there's a place that is trying to take the game to the very, very highest level that it could be and, and seek perfection, right? And I think the Masters Tournament is the is the performing side of that too, right? We know that the players are always uh, chasing perfection in golf. We're trying to chase perfection that we're never gonna have. And the Masters Tournament is kind of the um, a, a televised example of that, right? Like cost be damned, let's make this as great as we can make it. And guess what? It's pretty freaking great, I think. When I say every little detail about the Masters is perfect, I'm not kidding you. They've got these great uh, spectator guides, right? Best spectator guides I've ever seen program, they're free. Scorecard holders are the exact same size as the scorecards. The pencils have green erasers. The bedspreads have logos on them. The matches at Augusta have green tips. Everything about this place is fantastic. The par three scorecards have yardages and have handicaps if you wanna play a match in the par three course. Everything about the place is perfect. If you wanna learn more about the Masters, there is no shortage of great materials. The best one is going to the Masters website. They've got great stuff. They do great features themselves. Stan Purdy wrote a pretty good book about the golf course. Charles Price wrote a good book about the club and Bobby Jones and the founding of it with lots of cool pictures. And Frank Christian, made a bunch of, uh, he was official photographer for Augusta National and his book has a lot of uh, great old images. Three good books, lots of books. When I say lots of books, I mean lots of books. Like lots of books about the Masters in Augusta. Um, over several hundred. We'll have a list of the best ones that we think uh, in the show notes. Lots of good stuff. Thanks for watching. <laughs>